Okay, let's get started. Uh, a few administrative items to begin with. Um, I guess second of all, problem set uh, five is due. So please be sure that's turned in uh, before you leave today. I'd like to uh, return uh, problem set four. So these are here. As usual, they're arranged uh, alphabetically. So I'll pass these out here and let those make their way around the room. Um, let's see what else. Oh, uh, the law of conservation of problem sets dictates uh, that I should distribute uh, problem set six. Let me start that from the other end of the room. Okay. Um, and an observation that material we're going to start talking about today uh, is going to go along with material in the textbooks uh, under chapter six uh, in Furlough or chapter nine in, uh, in Nicholson and Schneider. Okay, questions about those administrative items? Okay, I'd like to, um, I would like to spend a little bit of time discussing uh, performance on the problem, on the, excuse me, on the midterm. Um, so our uh, valiant GSIs uh, devoted themselves over uh, many uh, tortuous hours uh, to the grading of the midterms over the weekend, and we have those uh, to return to you today. So let me go ahead and uh, pass Simmons back around as well. Um, those are all, also alphabetical. Uh, let me say a little bit of something about the uh, performance on the midterms. Um, so first of all, here's the, uh, here's the, uh, the just a simple histogram of uh, what, the, uh, what the midterms look like. So you can see, uh, you know, this is, these are percentage terms, there are 100 points available at the possible in the midterm. Uh, so here's the distribution. The mode you can see is somewhere around a half. That also turns out to be uh, really close to the mean on the exam. Um, a few, it looks like four people, uh, or maybe five people here, did you know, quite, quite well. We're sort of outliers on the exam. A couple of you had, uh, had unusual difficulty. There's a big mass here in the middle, uh, which I'll uh, come to in a moment. Now, something I should say about this, this is the midterm score. Probably, you may recall there was an extra credit uh, question on the, on the exam. So these scores reflect the addition of that extra credit associated with your ability to predict what your actual score on the midterm was. Okay. Um, all right. So if, this were, uh, sort of, if we were grading the midterms the way uh, we were grading the problem sets, um, most of you would have flunked. Um, that's why we curve the midterms. Uh, so, in fact, most of you didn't flunk. Uh, here's a, in fact, I think none of you flunked. Let me see. Just a second here. I'm having a <laughs> malfunction. Uh, here's, a, uh, here's a picture of the cumulative distribution. And I think we, I might need to, is that, is that legible? So what this is, is this, so let, me, let me, it sounds like some of you are interpreting this already. But, so this is, a, this is the cumulative distribution of scores, the empirical cumulative distribution of scores on the, on the exam. Um, so uh, the, on the vertical axis is the proportion of the class that got a score at least as high as the point that appears on the, on the bottom here. So to take a point, um, uh, the raw midterm score here of, Oh, I don't know about, this is about 50%. A little bit more than 60% of you got a score uh, lower than 0.6. So it accumulates. Um, at the very upper end, you can see the, the, the high score, I think. Oh, by the way, these are raw midterms. So this is not, does not include the extra credit. At the very top end, I think the high score was at 96. Um, can you confirm that, Jeff? Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's this person up here. Now, I've gone ahead and divided up the uh, distribution here into something, you know, into letter grades. Um, and, you know, something I'm going to, well, here, here are the points. So, uh, so reading this, if you got between a 70, above the 0.7 to 96, that's an A+. Plus. So that's the case for uh, four or five of you. Um, if you got between 0.55 and 0.7, uh, you got an A. If you got uh, 0.51 to 0.55, you got an A minus and, and so on. Questions about this graph? There's no questions. You guys are just absorbing it. Yes. The grade, the midterm grades online do include the extra credit. Yes. Uh, so if you go to the B space and look at the, mid, the score on the midterm, that includes the extra credit. Um, okay. So, so this is the raw, these are the raw scores with the addition of extra credit that will bump some of you up a little bit, bump nobody down, of course. Um, so that's the those are the basic grades. Okay. Questions about this? Yes. Yeah, so, so, so the raw midterm scores are effectively using those to determine the curve, and then uh, how well you do uh, predicting your score to you get the extra credit can bump you up over uh, a little bit. Um, I'll come back to the predictions in a moment. Is there another question? Okay. All right, so, um, so this is the main meat of what I wanted to say about the midterm scores. Uh, there's a couple other things I'll say that I think are interesting or maybe useful uh, for the rest for going forward. I don't know why my little oh, I know why. Okay, so here's the, uh, the raw midterm scores versus the predictions you made. So each of you turned in a prediction of your midterm score. Um, the, uh, so for, you know, between zero and one. Um, not all of you made a prediction, uh, maybe because you ran out of time or just didn't want to make yourself, I don't know. Um, but, but most of you did. Uh, you can see there's a pretty decent uh, positive relationship here. This blue line is just a 45 degree line. So if, if all of you are exactly able to predict your midterm performance, we see all the points just lined up exactly on that blue 45 degree line. Um, the green line is an ordinarily squares uh, fit to the data. Um, so that tells you something about, uh, about, the, about the relationship between your predictions, the actual relationship between your predictions and the actual outcomes. You can see it's got a positive slope. The slope though is, is significantly less than one. Um, what that's reflecting here are, are two things. Um, well, one central thing. So let me, let me do a little bit more interpretation of this. So uh, people who are really good at predicting their scores wind up close to the blue line. So, um, so these, actually this person up here who looks like they got the high score on the exam also was very, very accurately predicted that they <laughs> got 96. Um, so they're pretty much right on the line. There are some people in the middle here too who, who really nailed it. Uh, one of the, there's, a, there's a, rather, a rather poor performer over here who was nevertheless reasonably accurate in that prediction. Um, people, so we have names for people above and below the line. So the people, the people on the blue line are sort of very good at prediction. The people, um, the people above the line uh, we might refer to as, uh, as pessimists. These are people who predicted, who received a higher midterm grade uh, than they predicted they would. Um, the people, um, and this is most of you, who um, are below the blue line, uh, we might regard as optimists. Um, there's a, a bias here, or I'm not sure if bias is the right word, but uh, on average, people below the, I'm sorry, everyone below the blue line predicted a higher score on the midterm than they actually received. Now, I don't want to make too much of the optimism or pessimism, because that depends on silly things like how mean the graders are and stuff like that, so it's hard to predict. I'm more interested in the positive slope um, that we see, uh, you know, that goes through these uh, predictions. Yes, good question? Did you have your hand up? Oh, you had your hand up. Somebody did. Okay, thank you, thank you, pardon. Um, 
Okay, so there's a positive correlation, guys, where, I don't know, on balance, there's some value in your predictions that uh, relating the outcomes we observe to, uh, to your actual performance. Uh, here's another, um, another graph I'll share with you. Uh, if we look at the average problem set score person by person and use that to try to predict performance in the midterm, we also get a significant uh, positive um, relationship. Now, there's a lot of clumping of problem set scores up here. You guys have been doing a good job on the problem sets and perhaps a good job of collaborating on the problem sets. So there's sort of a massive points up here and a few you know, quite poor performance back here. Uh, you can see that poor performance on the problem sets is probably a more reliable predictor of poor, poor performance in the midterm. And then really good performance on the problem sets is a predictor of good performance. We have some people here who are doing quite well on the problem sets, but nevertheless turn in um, disappointing uh, midterm scores. But the message I want you to take that is not, not that, it's that there's a positive relationship. And um, I'd like to, uh, I, I believe it's true that uh, investments on the problem sets, working through them with your group, making sure you understand the material, is going to tend to yield a payoff in terms of uh, performance on the exams as well. Okay, questions about this stuff? Other questions about the midterm? Okay, now uh, yes. Yeah, sure. This one? I don't know if you can see the graph very well from back there. Is that visible? Okay, yes. Yeah, anyone who got higher than 0.70 got an A+, plus, is the way it is. And we terminated at 0.96 here because that was the high score. I mean, if somebody had gotten 100%, they'd obviously get an A+, as well. Okay. Um, are there other questions? Okay. Uh, all right. So I want to uh, turn my attention, turn our attention away from, um, from problem sets and exams and back to the main subject of the lecture today. Um, so what we're going to do today in terms of our coverage material is to really switch gears. So we spent the first half of the semester uh, developing a comprehension of the theory of demand. And that's really what we've been working on. We started off with a specification of uh, consumer preferences and thought about ways to characterize that. We worked with that to figure out how to make predictions about how much of different goods different consumers would demand. We developed uh, you know, some demand, Marshallian and Hicksian demand curves. Uh, we got Engel curves in there to think about how demand responds to changes in income. So we've really we've nailed down all the main elements of the theory of consumer demand in the first half of the semester. Um, so we're going to switch gears completely now. Um, and we're going to talk about the other half of microeconomics. We've done demand, and now we're going to do supply. Um, so we're going to do that today by starting in sort of a similar place uh, to where we were um, we're at the beginning of the semester, where we started by trying to characterize uh, consumers' preferences, and we're going to start today to start to characterize production functions, which are sort of analogous to utility functions. Um, and the, I'm sorry, production functions are to su the theory of supply as consumer utility functions are to the theory of demand. So that's kind of we're going to be starting off in an analogous place. Uh, I'm also going to start with another uh, a little quote from um, our friend Alfred Marshall. Uh, you'll recall he wrote sort of what I regard as the first textbook in economics, um, the first modern one at least. And he has this to say about production. Again, sort of pointing out the fact that there's, some, some, there's a lot of analogous material in production. Um, a lot of stuff what you see in our discussion of demand is going to show up in sort of the mirror form uh, when we talk about supply. So he says consumption may be regarded, regarded as negative production. Okay, um, so I said some of this. We're going to talk about the behavior of, we're going to talk about developing the theory of supply. That's going to be a discussion which is going to focus, instead of focusing on uh, consumers, we're going to turn our focus to the behavior of firms. Um, and so what we're going to do uh, sort of for the next few weeks is to talk about production functions. I'll do that today. Um, not today, but soon. We'll talk about technological change and ways to model that uh, via its influence on production functions. Um, we'll talk some about the organization of firms um, there, and then, and then moving on to sort of aggregating up, we'll talk about the organization of industry, and yeah, that'll occupy us for the next few weeks as I say. Okay, so that's sort of, that's the, uh, that's the roadmap. Let me go ahead and start with the uh, nuts and bolts and define it. Tell you what, what a production function is. So what's a production function? It's a function that converts inputs into outputs. Yes, Chris? Uh, yeah, I can. I'll, I'm going to put it back up later because I want to draw some figures. But, uh, um, so a production function is something that uh, combines uh, or takes inputs and produces outputs. So that's analogous again to a utility function. Um, for a utility function, you take consumption goods and produce utility. The difference here is that we always regard utility as being some single real number. Um, and for the case of a production function, we can have a bunch of inputs, um, you know, maybe uh, I don't know, iron and water and coal, and produce a bunch of outputs, uh, different kinds of steel, for example. Um, so the commodity space, this X might be exactly the same as what we used as the sort of uh, domain for the utility functions, we need to find those, but the space we map into is again the commodity space instead of the real one. Okay, so, but that, that's uh, formalism, the thing to remember is the production function maps inputs from space X into outputs that live, also live in space X, the commodity space. Okay, so here are some examples. A um, uh, farmer uh, who's going to grow rice uses inputs, the inputs I have listed here are labor, land, and water. So the, um, the, you know, all these things, labor, land, and water, are, points in the are, are elements of a point in the commodity space. Rice is another uh, subspace of that stuff. Okay, uh, if we want to build a house, um, the inputs are going to be things, again, like labor, uh, like building materials um, and tools, I suppose. Um, this, these are both sort of, oh, I don't know, these are, these are straightforward examples. These next two are sort of interesting, and we'll come back to them. So we're going to think about a couple different ways. So we'll, we'll think about two different classes of production functions designed to produce electricity. So one way to produce electricity is you set up a, a natural gas plant. The inputs are natural gas. You have to have some workers provide labor. You have turbines. So you keep the natural gas. It, uh, it um, heats water or something. It turns the turbines to produce electricity. Uh, another way to do it is with a completely different technology. Uh, in this case, with inputs of solar cells with labor and sunlight. This is a case where we have the same output, electricity, uh, but quite different sets of, uh, of inputs. Okay. Um, so you can see, if we sort of uh, looking at just these examples, uh, we can spend a long, I, I wrote down the first four examples that came to my mind. Um, if we were to, if I were to ask you, oh, name a production function and its inputs and outputs, we could spend a long time putting a long list on the board because all the commodities, you know, there's, there's just a myriad of things around us that are produced and they use a myriad of inputs in their production. Um, so we can have a really exhaustive, um, extremely tedious lecture describing in detail the inputs and outputs of a bunch of different production functions. Uh, I'm going to try to avoid that level of uh, tedious detail um, by doing a trick that economists often do, which is to kind of abstract from the details of the inputs and outputs uh, for a production function. Uh, for sure, we want to do that for sort of pedagogical reasons. Uh, practice, as a practical matter, it's also uh, often defensible. The group inputs and outputs, uh, I'm sorry, in, pardon me, the group outputs into Try one more time. The group inputs, there we go. The group inputs into one of two broad classes. And the two broad classes that economists like to use are capital and labor. Okay, so capital covers a lot of ground. In fact, it covers uh, um, uh, a really vast array of stuff. Um, so it could be a factory, it could be a form of capital. Um, I have that example here. If you're a farmer, a tractor is a form of capital. So is a hoe. Um, that's also a form of capital. Uh, the classical economists in the um, 
that I've already, yeah, sorry about that example. Yeah. <laughs> shuffle. shuffle is also a bit of capital. Um, um, uh, the classical economists, uh, so think of guys like David Ricardo in, in the 18th century, uh, we sort of inherited their classification. They had a third one. So they would have said that the three classes of inputs were labor, capital, and land. Um, so land is the third category of inputs. Um, that reflected to a large extent the fact that a really large proportion of, of, um, of production was still agricultural uh, in the 18th century. So it was just occupied a larger space uh, in these, uh, the classical economist's imagination. As a formal matter, we don't really need land to be a separate input at all. Though. We can just treat it as another form of capital. So if you're a farmer and you're trying to grow rice, land is an input you're going to need to have. But there's no, it's not really necessary to treat it distinct uh, from some other kind of capital. Uh, so we don't. Um, OK, so, so capital includes a bunch of stuff. I have a note here which is useful to remember um, because the models we're going to work with in this class, at least for a while, it's still going to be mostly static one period models. Um, so it might be better to think about capital instead of being a factory, for example, as being the services that are provided by that factory. So think of those as capital services or what you get from renting capital. So for a lot of the applications we'll consider, it's going to make sense not to think about building a factory to build something, but instead renting a fa uh, factory in order, to, in order to do something. So you can do that for one period without having to make uh, some kind of enormous investment. Okay. Um, uh, final critical thing to point out here is that we have abbreviations uh, for capital and labor. Uh, naturally enough, the abbreviation for uh, labor is the letter L. Um, a little less naturally, the abbreviation for capital is the letter K. Um, anyone, I'm sure somebody has some thoughts about why we use K instead of C. C. Do you have a well, yeah, so part of, part of the issue is that C is already taken because we use it for consumption. That's true. There's another good reason to use K, though. Yeah, so Chris, yeah, okay, I've got the answer. I've got the title here. What's your... Yeah, that's right. So we have, we have Karl Marx to thank for the, uh, for the capital K. Uh, he wrote this uh, treatise, Das Kapital, um, and it produced some of this notation. And uh, a big chunk of that book is a sort of restatement of his views, of, or his view of the views of the classical economists. And so he uh, perpetuated and to some degree formalized this division of, uh, of, of inputs into labor, capital, and land. Yes? Where is Ewell? Where is Ewell? Oh, Ewell. So Ewell... Um, uh, that's, so you're, you're thinking about something like a consumable input that doesn't stick around. Uh, we would probably, I think, it's, I think the answer is going to depend on the application. Um, so yeah, let, let me essentially avoid the answering the question in general. But let me also say that if there's only two inputs and fuel isn't labor, then it must be, must be capital. Um, so it may, maybe a better way to think of it is if you're a firm and you're trying to produce something that requires fuel, you might hire the services of a fuel provider. That might be a way to, to make that make a little more sense. Yes? Like Depends on the production function. Let me come back to that. Yeah. Uh, okay, let me keep going. All right, so uh, we're going to spend um, most of the time today uh, trying to think about ways to characterize production functions. And um, so there's going to be sort of two main ways we're going to attack this. Uh, so the first thing we're going to do is ask, we're going to ask a couple different questions. And the first question we're going to ask is this. If you have a production function that takes inputs, say, labor and capital, and you double the amount of labor and capital you put in, what happens to total production? Okay, and they, they, so there's a natural, uh, natural question. Well, if you double all the inputs, does uh, output more than double, exactly double, or less than double? And so consideration of those kinds of questions uh, is what we'll, we'll call returns to scale. So if you change the level of provision of all the inputs you're, you're providing, we're asking about returns to scale. Um, there's another question you can ask, which is this. Suppose you have a production function that calls for capital and labor, and you double the amount of labor but hold capital fixed. Uh, that leads us to a question of factor returns. We say, well, gee, what are the returns for the factor of labor as we increase it but hold the other inputs uh, fixed? And so there's two, two different kinds of questions we're going to ask about production, production functions. And answering those questions is going to lead us to different ways of characterizing the production function. Okay. Okay, so let me start by giving you a uh, definition to uh, returns to scale. Um, so let's, uh, this, is, this is a little bit formal. Um, but here, here's the step. So we're going to consider a production function f. Uh, this particular one is going to map the, the inputs x into a single real output. Uh, so it's easy to answer the question whether output doubles or not. Um, so in particular, we'll take two inputs, so x1 and x2. And if you guessed that that's so to facilitate my ability to draw graphs, you'd be correct. Okay. We're going to take a number, a real number, a lambda, which is greater than 1. And we'll think of that as a, a scale factor, a, a factor by which we'll imagine scaling up production. Okay, so here's the definition of returns to scale. Uh, returns to scale is, and this sort of echoes what I said a moment ago, if we take this number lambda, which is bigger than 1, and we increase uh, all our inputs, x1 and x2, by that same constant, so it might be 2 in my example a moment ago, if it's the case that, so let's, let's imagine lambda is equal to 2. If we double x1, double x2, and the result is we get out exactly twice the level of production we had before, then we say we have constant returns to scale. Um, okay, if we double the amount of inputs we provide, so we double x1, we double x2, but we wind up getting out more than twice the production we started with, then we say we have increasing returns to scale. And then finally, if we double uh, our, both our inputs, x1 and x2, but wind up getting out less than twice the output, uh, then you say we have decreasing returns to scale. All right, so can someone think of um, an example technology that you think might, um, might feature constant returns to scale? So constant returns to scale, you have a system of production, you double all the inputs, you get out twice the, twice the output. What, what, say it again? Okay, so Chris, uh, so what do you think? So Chris suggests peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Uh, what do you say the inputs are? Uh, the inputs, the, the, the space of inputs here, X is, uh, is peanut butter, uh, jelly, and bread. Okay, is it better already sliced? Okay, sliced bread. Um, so, uh, so if those are the inputs, and we start off with, say, two slices of bread, um, one tablespoon of peanut butter and one tablespoon of jelly, we got one peanut butter sandwich um, of some standard dimension. If we double all the inputs, so we now have four slices of bread, two tablespoons of peanut butter, and how much jelly did I give you? A tablespoon of jelly, two tablespoons of jelly, we can make twice as many sandwiches.